The Magician's Niece presents Sinisterhood by Helena Marie Chandler. Music by Adrian Romero. Chapter 47 The Dodo. Dawn had been trying to read her auntie's diary every night before bed. She'd turn off the light and slip under her duvet, scanning the pages and scanning the words with her torch and with her memories. Dawn hadn't understood a lot of it, but she could tell that her mummy and her lovely auntie Kira didn't like each other at all. Etta told Dawn that sometimes sisters fall out with each other and the wounds never heal. That's what happened with her grandmother and her great aunt because they both wanted the same grand house and only one of them could have it. They wanted to have the same clothes and the same fur coat, but they could never wear the same things at the same time. Breakfast was being prepared downstairs. It was Saturday and on Saturday they always had pancakes. Mrs. Wade was making the batter and the radio was on. Dawn was the first one awake and the first to come downstairs. She was looking out of the window and into the garden. It was a sunny autumn day, but there was a lot of sparkling dew on the ground. The place looked almost magical. It looked like the leaves were crying. Dawn thought about the cuckoos and the big baby bird trying to take all the food from the little baby birds and how they made the mummy and daddy birds go completely crazy. Was this what happened with all families? Dawn put her thoughts to Mrs. Wade. What happens in a house when one child is bigger and hungrier and takes everything from the other child? Mrs. Wade dropped a knob of butter into the frying pan. It danced around the dish and began to melt and sizzle. Dawn looked on with fascination as Mrs. Wade poured the thick batter into the pan. Bubbles started erupting as the skin formed on top. I don't know what you mean, Dawn. Do you mean when a big child has to welcome a newborn into a home? Dawn nodded distractedly. Sometimes things go swimmingly. Sometimes big brothers and sisters love to take care of the little ones. It's like having a doll to play with. But sometimes, if there isn't enough love to go around, they get a bit left out. And then they can feel a bit angry at the new baby and sometimes they do naughty things to get the attention from their parents again. Dawn sat down. She had a good think about what Mrs. Wade was saying. Mrs. Wade brought over her first pancake and a jar of jam and some lemon and sugar. Dawn was still staring wildly into space. Eat up, Dawny, it's going to get cold. If there isn't enough love, is the big child always naughty? Can't they do some more nice things to get the intention instead? I suppose it depends on the way they've been brought up. I suppose it depends on whether they get any attention at all. Dawn took the first bite of her pancake. It was a little bit soggy, but she didn't want to tell Mrs. Wade and be rude. Tasty? asked Mrs. Wade, her eyebrows raised. Delicious, thank you, said Dawn, but she didn't really mean it. She paused for a moment and thought about how best to phrase her next question. Can one sister do a bad thing and then blame the other sister because they don't want to get told off by their parents? They'd have to be pretty harsh parents, Mrs. Wade replied, but some parents can be very nasty to their children and make them very afraid. Dawn had never met her grandparents, but she was afraid of her own mother. She couldn't quite put her finger on it, but she just knew that she wasn't very kind. Dawn was also a bit confused about the diary, because she was beginning to wonder about Auntie Kira too. But Dawn smiled with the thought, as she took the next bite of her pancake and jam, that everything would soon be sorted out when Auntie Kira came back from her long holiday. Chapter 48 The Crow That psychiatrist, Dr. Sophia Wisdom Jones, had been quite forthright on the telephone. Insistent, in fact. So sure of herself, 
She spoke with the kind of conviction that were the hallmark of only revolutionary teenagers and party political activists. There was no dissuading the woman that this action was not the right one to take. Did she really think that Gerald was some kind of crusty misogynist who wanted to prevent a poor and helpless near widow from living the rest of her days in some semblance of comfort? What about Little Dawn? What about Ms Dunleavy's final wishes? This whole affair was leaving Gerald with a dark and bitter taste in his mouth. He knew that it was Mrs Burton Swift who paid the school fees. She'd informed him of this very many times in the several voicemail messages she'd left him. But if the house were to be left to Dawn and she sold it, she could pay for her own school fees anyway. What's more, the financial independence would rid Dawn of her mother once and for all. Gerald had found over the past few weeks that he'd been growing more and more weary of this Burton Swift woman. Of course, there were Kira's allusions to her sister and her queer ways when she was still alive, but then there were also Nigel's more recent comments, and the fact that Victoria was behaving just like that nasty prick Derek Goshawk. He knew her type. He'd overseen the enactment of many a bitterly fought will, and if he'd had anything to do with it, He'd have ensured that Mrs. Burton Swift didn't receive a single penny from the estate, but he didn't have anything to do with it. Once medical professionals poked their board-certified and government-approved noses in, there was no way a mere provincial solicitor like Gerald could have any influence at all. Dawn, according to this lady of all-knowing wisdom, was to be certified incompetent. But in all Gerald's interactions with the girl, Dawn had been nothing of the sort. Yes, perhaps she was not as sharp as other young women of her age, but Gerald thought that she was a very impressive and competent individual. He had to hand it to this Dr Jones lady that the school for whom she worked had done a good job in bringing the best out of Dawn. But now that they had, couldn't they just let her lead her own life? Yes, with supervision from a permanent professional resident, even if it meant the sale of the Wimbledon mansion and the ultimate purchase of a smaller abode. But it did pain Gerald to see how much Dawn and that nice little friend of hers were attached to that gorgeous Victorian house. They were making all kinds of plans, discussing what colours they would paint the walls, which of their possessions they would place in which room. All of it made Gerald think of his own grown-up daughters and how they would spend endless hours playing house as little girls. Chapter 49. The Peacock. Nigel was picking out photographs of his beautiful ex-wife to put in the order of service. It was heartbreaking, really. They were always so close, such good friends. Nigel found he couldn't bear the sight of it all. As he looked at Kira's smile, her hair, her beautiful dresses, her style, her timid and self-deprecating comportment as illustrated in all the shiny photographs he'd laid out across the living room floor. The thought that it had never worked out between them brought great anguish and grinding of his teeth. He couldn't face the fact that the repressive times of their early twenties had driven them into a passionless marriage. He couldn't bear to think that he'd been untruthful to her, and that for so many years. As Nigel looked through the collection of images taken across the decade or so that they were together, and the further 15 years that they had been good friends, he was finding it harder and harder to believe that this lady whose life had been one of joy and giving had died so prematurely and in such a sad and dramatic fashion. Nigel found now, though, that he understood those stories he had so often heard of people taking their own lives in such surprising and unexpected ways. Those stories he'd been told of friends of friends, never having shown a hint of depression in the years, months, weeks and days before their suicides suddenly began to ring true. He could now comprehend that a person, pained and distraught, might not even show a hint of sadness to anyone. He felt it so achingly sad that Kira had been one of those people, never wanting to trouble anyone else with her desperate discomfort and despair. Nigel was happy, though, to be organising this celebration of her life. He was happy, too, that all those people Kira had loved, all those people whose lives she'd touched, would be able to join together in the celebratory send-off. 
Nigel had found that he wasn't sure what to do, therefore, when he received a phone call from Derek demanding that he be invited to the event. True, Kira had, at one time, loved Derek. Loved, perhaps, the thought of Derek. She'd certainly touched his life, sprinkling it with glee and happiness in the form of thousands and thousands of golden coins, coins that he'd inhaled so greedily and quickly, like a ravenous pig or a dog. Oh, Nigel had to stop himself from going there, to the worst pit of his guilt and sorryful imagination. Just a hint of the thought that he could have driven Kira to Derek, and from Derek to taking her own life made him wretch, made his neck damp and his palms sweaty. Nigel did realise, of course, the part that he himself played in that fool coming to loll about in his own house and to sleep in his old bed beside his gem of a wonderful ex-wife. And he supposed, therefore, that that red-faced oaf had some right to be at the church. Nigel would certainly bar the man, however, from the dew at the Dorchester afterwards. There was no way that he was going to be £35 out of pocket, filling Derek the dustbin's ample gut with expensive wine, fillet steak and gold-leafed pavlova. Nigel may have been generous, but he was certainly not a fool. Dastardly Derek had already benefited hugely from his wealth. He was a cuckoo in Kira's Wimbledon nest, and it was a nest that Nigel had provided. Nigel ground his teeth at the thought of all those adverts and episodes of disreputable soap operas that he'd had to put himself through just to pay the mortgage on the house. Still, it salved his conscience that he'd done his part for Kira. He'd just have to be sure to be disciplined on the day, to hold back his rage and harness his anger. Nigel would take every precaution he could to ensure that he didn't strangle that fat man's neck during Kira's final send-off. Chapter 50. The Vulture. Victoria had been planning her outfit all week. The thought of the comments that might be showered upon her made a whistle of thrill travel through her gut and up her throat and land on her lips with a smile. My God, I thought you were Kira, they might say, or I had no idea Kira had a twin. Perhaps even, I nearly did a double take, might be the echoed refrain. Somewhere deep inside herself, Victoria had come to think that if she emphasised the resemblance, she too would be receiving some of the adoration garnered by Kira on that very special day. Victoria had been studying Kira's passport photo to ensure that she got her hair and makeup just right. She went out to Boots to buy the same shade of mauvish lipstick that her sister had taken to wearing since all her golden locks had fallen out. She bought a pair of the same sensible middle-aged shoes that Kira had purchased from Clark's. She sourced a light blue cashmere turtleneck from Marks and Spencer's and had a brown and cream kilt made by the dressmaker in town. Victoria would also add a special touch to her outfit, a bitter and poignant touch, one whose symbolic significance no one else in that church hall and that hotel restaurant would be at all aware. She'd been wearing a long pearl necklace. Of course, Victoria could have been a little naughtier and worn the very clothes with which Kira had travelled to Belfast on her special birthday trip. But Victoria had been so stringent with her planning, so meticulous with her project thus far, that she decided that such a darkly humorous move in dressing was not at all worth the risk. Victoria thought it interesting, as she embarked on her plane journey from Aldergrove to Heathrow, that she was taking Kira's final trip in reverse. She wondered if it had been the same gentleman piloting the route. She wondered if her sister had been attended to by the same lady stewardesses. She laughed a little at these sinister thoughts as she sipped on her ice-cold Gordons and sparkling tonic water in a plastic glass. Victoria had booked herself into the Dorchester that night, a little beyond her current means, but the kind of establishment that she'd soon be able to no doubt amply afford. She'd be seeing Dr Jones, who was to accompany Dawn to the event the very next day, and she spent the long evening practising her best timid voice and strained expression in front of her hotel bathroom mirror. The papers had been printed. They were winging their way from the solicitors. The psychiatrist was willing to sign. And that magical concept, those all-benefiting words, power of attorney, 
were to be benefiting her first thing on Monday morning. Chapter 51 The Dodo Mrs. Wade had taken Dawn and Etta to Kira's house first thing that morning. It was Sunday, and the party that everybody had been talking about was to be held that afternoon. Dawn had spent the morning tidying Kira's bedroom. She'd shaken out and folded the dusty clothes she'd found in the cupboard, and put the four lavender cushions she'd made in craft class in various drawers around the room. Dawn wanted it to be all nice and welcoming for when Auntie Kira decided to stop playing hide-and-seek. The game had been going on for a very long time now, and it was getting very boring. Auntie Kira needed to give up before everyone forgot who and where she was. The house was getting quite dirty because it hadn't been cleaned for many weeks. Dawn decided to give the place a hoover. Dawn saw that Mrs. Wade had been looking at her with a strange expression on her face as she fumbled about with all the wires, plugs and appliances in the messy utility room. You'll come and live with us, won't you, Mrs. Wade? bellowed Dawn from the depths of the airing cupboard. Anything you want, my dear. Will you help me make Auntie Kira's bed? asked Dawn. I've got a feeling that Auntie Kira might come to her party this afternoon and I want to make sure she has a good night's sleep. She'll be very, very tired from her long journey. Chapter 52 The Cuckoo How bad could this famous Victoria be, thought Derek, over his bowl of shredded wheat in his fresh copy of that morning's Sunday mail. Over the years he'd gathered a somewhat vivid image of this woman, jigsaw pieces clumsily clicked into place, hazy images garnered through all the snide comments peppered into conversation by his former wife, Kira. Derek had always judged Kira's comments about her sister to be ones of mere bitterness. Sisters are never the best judges of each other's characters. They're too close, too competitive. They know precisely which buttons to best push in order to light fireworks and start wars. They simply couldn't resist it. The picture that Derek had painted, therefore, of this woman Victoria in his mind was one much less nasty than that which Kira's words had long ago described. There was no doubt not enough affection to be had in the family home. That was certainly evinced by Kira's permanent and martyrish crusade to ensure that everyone always felt sorry for her. Derek had shouldered the constant request for reassurance during the first couple of years of their relationship, but he soon tired of it and found that he really couldn't be bothered to keep on bolstering her ego. The last time Derek had seen Victoria was on the day that he and Kira had wed. Derek couldn't say that he remembered much about the woman, other than the fact that she looked much more adamite and solid than his own little bird of an ex-wife. Victoria was no doubt just a pragmatic woman. Kira's assessment of Victoria's harshness was most probably just indicative of a practical way of being in life. Kira would complain about colleagues and acquaintances with an agonising and incessant rhythm. Derek knew these people to be just professionals or simply busy. Not everyone had the time or inclination to engage in some silly dance of niceties and permanently patting each other on the back. Kira was far too sensitive. The thought that he might partner up with a tough old bird, a woman who acted more like a mate, was quite refreshing. They could be mates. They might not even have to bother with all that silly sex nonsense. Derek might be allowed to drive fast cars, watch motor racing on a Sunday, or perhaps even take part. Maybe this woman could be his co-driver on rallies. Maybe they could take motorcycle trips to the Lake District, or perhaps even further afield, perhaps abroad. He wouldn't even have to marry her. The modern way was just to live together, especially if there was already a husband, as Nigel had said, clinging on to life. In any case, that poor old fucker would never have the capacity to disturb them. 
Apparently he'd been tucked away at quite a distance in some ghastly place euphemistically called a home. Derek downed the last of his grapefruit juice, and he gave a satisfied smack of his lips. Kira was unhappy. Kira couldn't enjoy life anymore. They were all describing things in the past. Did that really mean, Dawn wondered, that Auntie Kira didn't have a future? Dawn was both upset and confused. She didn't dare ask Dr. Jones if Auntie Kira was never coming back because she was afraid she'd get the answer she didn't want to hear. At least if she kept her mouth shut and her thoughts to herself, She'd still have the hope that her aunt would return, and that they'd live together in that big old house, and that they'd go on walks to Wimbledon Common, and that they'd go out for meals with Etta and Uncle Nigel. And they'd have lots of laughs together, for many more years to come. But Dawn did know that she knew it now, that her auntie Kira wasn't ever coming back. And as she looked up at the dimpled face of her mother sitting next to her, the woman who looked so much like her auntie Kira now, but of course could never replace her. She knew that her mother knew exactly what had happened to her auntie. Because if Auntie Kira was dead, it was her mummy who was the very last person to see her alive. Dawn began to edge a little bit sideways on the pew. She shuffled away from her mother's arm and drew herself in closer, a little bit closer to a person she could trust. The lovely, wise and owl-like Dr. Sophia Jones. Chapter 55 The Cuckoo My God, these seats are uncomfortable, thought Derek to himself, as the service trundled on in a bitter cacophony of sickly eulogies and sycophantic tears. Not so much as a sausage roll or a glass of wine, he muttered to himself. Nigel really is a tight horse. Derek's stomach was rumbling, loud. He was used to at least three bourbon biscuits and a large coffee for elevenses. He hadn't had anything since his shredded wheat at eight o'clock this morning. Derek fumbled about in his pockets in the hope of discovering an item of long lost treasure in the dusty corners of his jacket or indeed his corduroy trousers. A Werther's, for instance, an unopened sherbet lemon. All he found, however, was a single half-sucked polo, hard baked with dust and congealed and cemented to the inside pocket of his coat. Derek was sitting two rows in front of Victoria in the church. He kept snatching glances over his shoulder at the woman, attempting to assess this female specimen and all her potential vulnerabilities. Derek scanned her comportment, her appearance, her dress to spot any areas of weakness. Much to his disappointment, however, this woman wasn't blokey at all. She was wearing a sack of clothes, positively geriatric, a frumpy kilt, a turtleneck, an ancient string of pearls. Victoria, by Derek's calculations, could have only been 42, but she looked like a veritable grandma, surely not an adventurer or an aficionado of all things sport. Furthermore, having always thought that the pair of sisters were physical opposites, Derek found himself surprised, indeed a little bit nauseated, queasy at the sight of a woman who looked identical to how Kira appeared in those few latter years of her life. All that cancer treatment had left Kira with a small dark bob of brown hair. She'd gained a good number of stones. Derek hadn't realised it until now, but Kira had morphed into her sister. Or was it the other way around? Surely a woman in her early forties wouldn't choose such hideous attire. Surely she'd put on makeup, not like Kira who'd seemed to have long given up on herself, especially towards the end of her life. Derek had a good think about all this evidence he beheld. Was he seeing in this woman something that he had long known in himself? 
a chameleon coldness, an ability to morph oneself to suit the scene, the situation, to ensure maximum mileage was garnered in the form of empathy, condolence, guilt, generosity, love, attention, money. This woman was at the memorial service in character. She was playing Kira's part, and all that warmth and affection intended for an invisible corpse was flowing instead to her. Victoria was sitting upright in her pew. Her shoulders were pulled back. She had an air of faux nobility about her, of which only experienced dupers, dupers like Derek, could possibly ever see. The princess of sorrows, the meek of hearts, was that, yes it was, she was even pretending to cry. Derek turned back to the front of the church hall, where Nigel was preening on stage, marching back and forth with microphone in hand. No one else seemed to realise that he was a complete and utter fraud. Derek, in all his years of experience, couldn't articulate the reasons as to why. It was simply a visceral knowing, an insight incarnate, garnered by his sinews and bones after all his years of many schemes and much rigorous observation. He didn't know what it was about Nigel. He just felt like the man was a toad. Derek began to wonder what was to be the best course of action in this very particular situation. He let his mind drift, attempted to envisage himself sharing a bed with that sack of a woman. Was it true that opposites enjoyed the highest level of attraction to each other? Or was that just some sorry excuse streamed up by a desperate twit in an unhappy relationship? Could people so similar, not in appearance, but in character, as he and Victoria, ever possibly hit it off? Derek turned back to consider the woman. Yes, she was rocking backwards and forwards in her grief. Yes, there were tears, but where was the straining of the eyes? Where was the smudging of the makeup? Only a sleuth of manipulative people, like Derek, could notice such apparently minor details. And then he saw that little girl sitting next to her horrible mother. He sighed as he thought of all the hassle that that imbecile of a child would be. Derek wondered if all the mental energy he'd expended so far in his new project hadn't, in fact, been a waste of time. Better, he thought, as he scrunched up his order of service to find a petite blonde in the Harrods hair salon that he could slowly work on and eventually bleed clean and dry. dinner at the nice hotel and in her bedroom afterwards and during breakfast the next day and during craft class and when she sat at break time watching the birds in the garden all on her own. No one could say anything that would make her feel all right. Not Etta, not Mrs Wade and especially not Dr Jones because Auntie Kira was never coming back. Dawn had to admit that somewhere deep inside her brain she'd already known that she'd never see her auntie again. She just didn't want to let herself feel all the bad things that come when somebody finally leaves you. And with all the times that Etta had told her to forget about her mother, Dawn had let herself forget that her mother definitely knew where Auntie Kira was. Because as much as everybody said that Auntie Kira was sleeping at the bottom of the ocean, Dawn just didn't believe it. Auntie Kira hated cruises, and she hadn't been at all sad. And as much as everybody said that Auntie Kira was unhappy, Dawn just didn't believe it. All of these thoughts were stirred again when Dr. Jones called Dawn in for a special meeting. Dawn's mother was there, and she still looked like Auntie Kira, and she was wearing the same kind of shoes, and the same kind of jumper, and the same kind of skirt as Auntie Kira used to wear. Dawn didn't know why she didn't like these clothes, or indeed the clothes her mummy was wearing yesterday but she still knew that she didn't like them. Did Mummy want to make Dawn feel like she was the new Auntie Kira? Dr Jones had a tight forehead and tight cheeks, and she wasn't speaking, but she was still looking right at Dawn. Do you know why we're here, Dawn? asked Dr Jones. 
The psychiatrist wasn't smiling like she usually did. Dawn shook her head. Dr. Jones nodded towards her mother. We've all come to my office together to talk about something very important. Do you know what this important thing is? Dawn thought for a moment. What important things were to be soon appearing on her horizon? The trip to a show in the West End? The day when they were all going to move into Auntie Kira's old house? Or was it Dawn's birthday, which was going to happen in only two weeks' time? My 18th birthday? asked Dawn. Well, it does have something to do with that. Dawn looked at her mother, but her mother didn't smile back. It's about your age and where you're going to be living. Dawn straightened in her seat. Her fingers were dancing in her palms. She smiled breathlessly and said, When do I get to move in? Dawn heard her mother give a low-pitched tsk in the corner. Dr. Jones placed her warm hands on Dawn's shaking knee. I've been meaning to tell you, Dawn, for a number of weeks, but I thought today was the best day to discuss it, because your mother came over for Kira's service, and she's the person whom all this affects. Dawn felt a bitter wave of warmth rise up from her stomach and into her throat. What do you mean, Dr. Jones? She means, Dawn, that you can't live on your own, came her mother's voice from the other end of the sofa. But I won't be living alone. I'll be living with Etta, and I'll be living with Mrs. Wade. Dawn was about to say, and I'll be living with Auntie Kira. But she caught herself, and she stopped herself, and she remembered that Kira had gone. It's not about who's living there, Dawn, came Dr. Jones's calmer voice. It's about who owns the house, and I'm afraid I can't allow you to own it. Why can't I own it? I'm going to be an adult very soon. Well, that's just it, Dawn. Numerically, you're an adult but legally I can't allow you to be recognised as one. Dawn had no idea what numerical and legally meant, but she knew that her nasty mother had something to do with this sudden change of events. Dawn turned to look at the woman, and her eyebrows slanted steeply down towards her nose. You witch, she said, quite calmly and very quietly too. You see, Dr Jones, you see how my daughter treats me? Dawn saw Dr. Jones smile sympathetically at her mum. Dawn knew that they'd been planning together and that they'd been planning all this time against her. You don't mean it, Dawn. You're just very upset. Your mother has nothing to do with Auntie Kira's death. Let's just make that very clear. So who's going to get the house then? Dawn asked, her voice soft and quiet. Your mother is going to have something called power of attorney and she'll decide whether to keep the house or whether to sell it, because she knows about the financial side of things, and she's only got your best interests at heart. Dawn was so upset and angry that she just sat there. She couldn't speak. It was another blunt blow right in the centre of her chest, and she was quickly beginning to realise that she had absolutely no way of fighting back. But she wasn't going to cry in front of Dr Jones, and she wasn't going to cry in front of her mother. Instead, Dawn stood up, and she asked if she could go. Dr. Jones looked at her. Wearily, she said, aren't you going to say goodbye to your mother? Dawn left the room. That afternoon, Mrs. Wade walked with Dawn to Auntie Kira's house in Wimbledon. Dawn climbed the creaking staircase. She waited until Mrs. Wade had turned the radio on in the kitchen, and then she fell face first onto Auntie Kira's bed, and she cried, and she cried, and she cried. Saturday, 8th of January, 1973. Term has already started, but I can't help going over the Pearl incident again and again in my mind. Am I really such a terrible person? Was I capable of such horrific bullying at such an advanced age? Why did I resent Victoria's arrival so much? Why was I so in need of impressing my own parents? I'm coming to think that they were never really worth impressing. The more I find out about children, the more I realise where the fault lay. 
but I'm finding I can't live with the guilt of what I did to Victoria. I am considering phoning up my sister to ask for her side of the story, what she remembers of what happened that day and the days after. Surely she must be incredibly traumatised by the way she was treated by the parents and by the church. But if I do talk to her about it, I risk rousing the tiger. Vesuvius erupting has always been an event I've taken so many pains to avoid. Why needlessly stir the witch's cauldron? Did I make her a witch? In any case, if I do contact her about this, I am sort of admitting my wrongdoing and I simply can't trust my sister to forgive me and to move on. And anyway, if the Geoffrey incident was my payment, then justice has already well and truly been done. This new perspective on the Pearl Necklace affair has prompted endless thoughts about all those other unsavoury happenings that took place under the roof of our childhood home. There was that time I recited a rude joke to Victoria and told her to tell it to Mummy because I said it would make her laugh. But Mummy didn't find it funny just as I knew she wouldn't. And Victoria was dragged into the lavatory by her pigtails and locked there without any tea. I've always laughed at that memory, but now I just feel incredibly bad. My parents took everything so seriously. They were almost evangelical in their discipline, always so paranoid about what their golfing friends thought and no doubt about what God thought as well. Suffer the little children. That never, ever happened in our house. Oh God, all of this is bringing back the memory of the very worst of the punishments that took place in our home. It happened after Victoria took to poisoning my rabbits, Mary and Martha. I think my parents were so in despair that their own child was displaying such cruel characteristics. These days you might send a child like that to a psychiatrist for counselling. But in the 40s and 50s, when we were growing up, It was believed that the root of any bad behaviour was in the sparing of the rod. When I told my parents what had happened to the animals, Victoria was beaten severely. In those days, beatings were usually saved for boys, but my father, no doubt, wanted to beat out all the badness from his daughter as soon as he possibly could. It's odd to think now that my parents thought that kind of treatment was the best means of correcting a wrongdoing. Surely it just drove her to more. But why did she poison my rabbits? And how did she poison them? I've got no recollection of that. I just remember waking up one morning and going to feed them and finding them both dead. Perhaps she didn't even poison them at all. Maybe they died of natural causes. I've been talking to Nigel about my memories. He just keeps telling me that it's best to live for today. I wish I could do that, but my mind always was. He's more of a hedonistic, practical person. I think I'm just somebody who simply likes to agonise. I wish I could find out what happened to those rabbits, and I wish I could find out why Victoria took to despising me so much. Were the pearls really the turning point? Or did she drive me to it, even though she was just a tiny thing? If I could just work out why and how she did it, perhaps I might work out why there has always been so much resentment between us. prod the monster in the cage. But Etta was wrong that Dawn could ever be able to drop her thoughts, to rub out all of her suspicions. Not for a very long time, anyway. As Dawn sat there on the bench in the Lotan's gardens, the crisp and orange leaves crunching between her swinging feet, she thought about Auntie Kira's big house, and she thought about her mummy's greed, and she wondered if yesterday's meeting with Dr. Jones wasn't the proof she needed to show that Mummy wanted Auntie Kira to finally be gone. Dawn felt angry, 
She felt angry with herself. She felt angry with her mother. She felt angry with Dr. Jones. How could she not have known it earlier, that she would never be allowed to own a house? She was so silly for getting all of her hopes up, because people like her, people who weren't clever or tall or normal, they never got to do anything without other people getting involved. How could her mother be so shameless and greedy? She was taking everything away from Dawn, all her hopes of freedom and a grown-up life. Mummy already had a big house with lots of bedrooms. She didn't need another one with many bedrooms more. Who was going to sleep in all the bedrooms? She didn't have any pets, apart from those scrawny, biting cats, Karma and Sutra. She only poisoned pets. That's what Auntie Kira said. Mummy couldn't care less about the lives of anybody else except her own. How could Dr. Jones act so silly? She went to university and did very well at school. She was very clever and looked inside people's brains. But apparently she couldn't see what was right there in front of her. A tricky person. A horrible person whose whole life was about ruining everybody else's. Dawn was kicking up the leaves more angrily now. She was supposed to be the silly one. She was supposed to be the one who didn't have a clue about anything. She was the one who needed help tying up her shoelaces and doing her hair and making her bed and writing her letters. But she could see so much that Dr. Jones just couldn't. Dr. Jones looked inside at people's thoughts and feelings, but she didn't seem to see what was painted right on their faces. Dawn stopped her feet from swinging for a moment. She had a thought, a special thought, and she decided to sit cross-legged on the bench to think it. Mummy's face was painted just like Auntie Kira's face was painted when she wore her pretty makeup. Mummy was wearing the same clothes at the party, and now she was moving into Auntie Kira's house. It was as if Mummy was becoming Auntie Kira. She was replacing Auntie Kira. She was like a cuckoo moving into Auntie Kira's nest, starving all the other chicks. Dawn was beginning to worry that she might be starved too. Gosh, thought Dawn. Mummy must really have hated Auntie Kira to want to eat all her food and take all her things, just like the big cuckoos did. She was even going to take Auntie Kira's job, her job of looking after Dawn. Dawn shook her head. She didn't want it. She wouldn't let Mummy take it. She would refuse to have her as her guardian instead of Auntie Kira. She wouldn't go home at half term for her birthday like Dr. Jones said she wanted. She wouldn't accept any more of her mother's silly gifts. She didn't want Mummy to take any of her things. She didn't want her to eat all her food, the food Mrs. Wade cooked her. She didn't want Mummy to take the keys to Lotan's too. She didn't want Mummy to have the house that was hers and Etta's and Mrs. Wade's and Kate's and Laura's and Ginny's and Anne's, all the girls that lived with her. Dawn looked up to the sky. She was breathing deeply. She could hear her breath and her heartbeat sounding in her ears. But there they were, a little cloud of swallows dancing in the air. A family, thought Dawn, all flying together, in tune with each other, listening to each other with their cries and their wings in the sky. Dawn smiled at what she saw. She thought that she too would like to soar up high, to fly through the winds just like them, to dance in the air and never come down, and to dance with her family, with her daddy and her auntie Kira and her uncle Nigel in tune with their cries and their wings and their sky. Dawn looked down to the ground again. She'd never saw, and she'd never dance, and she'd be stuck there at Lowton School forever. Dawn thought about Auntie Kira. Her eyes felt wet. She missed her so much, especially today. Today was a Tuesday, and on Tuesdays Auntie Kira would always come to see Dawn and take her out to tea. Dawn would come back from lessons at half past three, She'd take off her uniform and put on her dress, and then she'd wait by the living room window. Auntie Kira would soon arrive at the house in her big green car. Auntie Kira would see Dawn straight away, but she'd still honk very loudly on the horn. Birds would leap from the trees with the sound of the screech, and Dawn would rush to the front door. Auntie Kira didn't need to honk the horn. She must have done it to show everybody and all the school and all the birds how happy she was to see her girl and to tell them all just how much she loved her. Dawn would say goodbye to Mrs. Wade, and then she'd rush through the door and out into the drive. Auntie Kira would wind down the window, and she would wave and she'd say, 
Hi, Dawny, how was school? Dawn would run towards her and she'd give her a big hug and then they'd go for tea and she'd only come back to school when it was time for dinner. Oh, just to see Auntie Kira again, with her big smile and her hugging arms, that was everything Dawn wished for in the world. But she knew, after that party on Sunday, and after that horrible meeting with Mummy, that that everything was impossible, because Auntie Kira now only lived in Dawn's imagination. She did live, though, too, on the pages of her secret diary. Dawn was quite shocked at how nasty Auntie Kira had been when she was a little girl. Dawn supposed that everyone could be nasty if they wanted to be. Dawn herself had probably been quite nasty when she was small as well. She'd have to ask Etta, because Etta was bigger than her. And she would remember, like Auntie Kira remembered, like how she described things about Mummy in her secret book. The story about the pearls, though, that was quite horrible. It was very horrible to make somebody else get told off instead of you, when you were the one who lost things. But in the story in Auntie Kira's book, the somebody was Mummy, and Mummy was a baddie, and so she most probably deserved it. And then there were the stories about the rabbits being poisoned. Dawn thought that it wasn't very surprising that Mummy poisoned Auntie Kira's rabbits, because she had the deadly nightshade in the garden, and she said that it was enough to kill a dodo. Dodos are animals. Rabbits are animals. Auntie Kira's are animals too. The bell was beginning to ring. It was lunchtime. The bell was sounding, but Dawn wasn't listening. She was thinking. She was lost in thought. If somebody killed my rabbits, I would let them get beaten by my daddy for absolutely sure. Mrs. Wade was knocking on the window now. Dawn looked back to the kitchen. The kind old lady was standing there with her apron on and an angry look on her face. She was beckoning Dawn back to the house. But Dawn had to think. She needed one last thought before she left the bench and the leaves and the garden and the birds. What had she learnt from the diaries? Dawn had definitely learnt that Mummy hated Auntie Kira and that Auntie Kira couldn't stand Mummy at all. It was just like Etta's family where one person was angry with another person and then that person got more angry and they got angry with their children and then everyone got angry again. The hatred between Mummy and Auntie Kira seemed to go back many, many years. And it was hard, and it was cold, and they never got the chance to melt it. Dawn was absolutely certain now that there was enough bitterness between them that Mummy could have easily pushed Auntie Kira into the deep blue sea. Mm -hmm.